Ken Wilbert, I first of all want to give um, our technician David Lee um, a round of applause because we're saying as long as it works, works. Let's wait on that. Know, okay. We'll wait to see if it works hard. But anyway, thank you guys. This will be I've heard Barry present different um, seminars before he's so full of information. He's gonna <laughs> Oh, Good <laughs> information, um, and so I know you're going to get a lot out of this. And just to to let you know a few things about Barry, he's the owner and founder of Blanton Advisors LLC, a CFO and business consulting practice here in the Woodlands. He focuses on empowering entrepreneurs and has done that for over 11 years. He's an accomplished financial and operational executive with 35 years. And a career in banking, housing, wholesale distribution, and consulting. He graduated from UT in 1982 with a BBA in finance. He's a committed community leader and volunteer. He has been recognized for those efforts by several organizations. He's the author of the Monday Morning Minute, founder of Live to Lead the Woodlands. He's a partner in Better Bookkeepers, a full service bookkeeping firm based in the Woodlands. He and his wife, Fran, have lived in the Woodlands for over 20 years. So without further ado, Barry Blanton. Thank you, Ann. Thank you all for being here. So before we get started, let me ask a couple of questions about the audience. If you love financials and love numbers and are on top of your accounting and are 100% confident in that, raise your hand. That's more than I expected. That's right. <laughs> if you can live with numbers, it's not your strength, but you know it's important. You try to deal with it. You're okay at it. Raise your hand. Okay. If you think numbers are horrible, you wish you weren't even sitting in this room, you can't spell the word accounting, but you know you ought to be paying attention to something you're not paying attention to yet, raise your hand. Okay, a few of those too. If you're just here to heckle the speaker, raise your hand. Thank you, Papa. Thank you. Okay. Some of the ones in the back being honest, at least. Thank you. So my name is Barry Blanton. I've got a CFO consulting practice here in the Woodlands, and some of my staff is joining us today, as is some of the staff of our bookkeeping partner company called Better Bookkeepers. And um, Ann used the, uh, one of our taglines in, in the intro about empowering entrepreneurs. And the way we like to do that is putting knowledge in entrepreneurs' hands to allow them to make better business decisions. And largely that is financial information. So we're going to talk a little bit about that today. Um, and, and just to give you an idea of what else is going on at this seminar uh, or this conference today, I just left a session where they said that you have to pay attention to emojis in text messages because they can be construed to be harassment. So let me just tell you, I'm not going to scare you with that kind of stuff today. We're going to talk about numbers that can help improve your business, not stuff that you need to be worried about like emojis and text messages. I just I couldn't believe that. Um, so the first thing that we want to talk about, if you, uh, we've got two pieces of the presentation today. And the first one is know your business model. And I talk about that first because if you don't understand your business model, it doesn't matter how good you are at accounting. You have to understand your basic business model. And so what do I mean by that? So the, we're going to talk about a reasonableness test. We're going to talk about if your business model is reasonable. We're going to talk about exactly how you're going to make money. And then we're going to try to answer four questions. Uh, what, who, why, and how. So there's a lot of great business ideas out there, but not all of them will pass the reasonableness test. For instance, that could be a good idea to a lot of people, right? Maybe. I don't know how reasonable that is. What about this one? <laughs> that one might be a reasonable idea. I don't know. Maybe not. But the question is, would either one of those pass the <laughs> test of going on this TV show? from a reasonableness standpoint, and the answer is probably no, although you never can tell about the Heineken water. Um, so the whole idea is that you have to understand what your business model is. So first we talk about what, and there are two aspects to the what question. What are your goods or services? 
you are either providing a good, a consumer good or a product, or you're providing a service. Second part of that what is what is the need for that service? Again, there are a lot of good business ideas. If there's not a need for the service, if there's not a demand for the good, you can't even get past the very first step. Who? Two questions again. Who is your buyer and who is your competition? You may wonder why it matters about who your competition is. If you don't understand your consumers alternate choices in the community or in the space that you're in, you're not going to be able to move your own product or your own goods. You have to understand who the buyer is and who your competition is. Why? Number one, why will they buy from you? What makes you different? How do you differentiate yourself? What is your why in your good or service that you're providing? Why are you different? And lastly is the how, and in a lot of ways, the most important piece. Number one, how are you gonna produce goods or deliver services? You can go out and sell them all day long. You gotta produce, produce them or deliver them. And then the most important thing, and we're gonna talk a whole lot more about tracking this, is how exactly will you make money? Can you fund it and is it scalable? So I'll just give you a quick example about this. Everybody, um, my son now lives in the woodlands, but for a while was living in Austin and he had a big uh, smoker pit that he had out in his backyard and he cooked brisket. And his sister kept telling him, you need to go into business selling brisket. Well, think about that for a second. He's one dude with one cooker in the backyard in Austin. And what's the biggest barbecue name in the world? Mm -hmm. Probably Franklin Barbecue is in, and, and 25 other famous names of barbecue. So we, we, we get off track even as to who the competition is and things like that. So the reason that I go, spend a minute over this before we even get to financials is just to talk a little bit about the importance of understanding your business model. The whole point that we're going to talk about next is how do you measure success and how do you track how well you're doing, but you have to be able to answer these questions first. So a couple of other things. Let me ask a little bit more about the audience. How many people, does anybody here provide goods, products? Are we all services, most services. We all service providers then instead, more service providers. So what about, here's a couple of other things to know about your business. I know you all know them, but are you a B to C provider? Is the consumer your buyer, a business to consumer <coughs> provider? Are you a B to B provider where you're a business to business provider? Um, those are pieces of understanding your model. Um, and this will make a difference too, to some degree in some of the stuff from accounting. Um, so we're gonna talk a little bit about financials. And uh, here's the things we're gonna go over if we have enough time. Why is accounting important? Uh, basic understanding of financial statements, how to review a balance sheet and a P&L. We're gonna talk about the organization of those. We're going to talk a little bit about why profit may not equal cash, a question that a lot of people ask me when they point to the bottom of the little QuickBooks report and says, it says I made this much, but my bank account doesn't have that in it. So, um, and then we're going to talk just a question about why we care about what's on the balance sheet. So why are accounting and financial reports important? Because if you don't pay attention to them, that's you. So you can't put your head in the sand and ignore the financial aspect of your business. If you don't know how you're doing, that's what you're doing. So that's a, a basic part of, about why they're important. But there's more aspects to that too. They're important because you need them for taxes. They're important because you may need them for your partner. They're important because you may need them for your bank. They're important because they, you may need them to show your spouse how your business is doing. So yes, you need to understand your business, but there's partners and um, other stakeholders related to your business that may want to understand the financial aspects of your business too. So here's something we're gonna talk a little bit about. And um, this reminds me so much of what Josh talked about this morning. And he, what do you call it? Chris? The ood oodle. 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 So it's a little bit different for the financial aspect of it, but if you start on the orange arrow, we always want to set financial goals. So we, the first step is to set targets. 
The next step is to monitor those financial results. The third step is to adjust or make action plans according to those and then readjust your financial goals and it's a circle. And in our case, in, in most financial reporting, we consider it a monthly financial rhythm of going through this process. And one of the key parts that we're going to focus on mostly today is how to monitor the financial results of your business. So we're going to look at the balance sheet first, and it's the most unexciting um, financial document you'll ever see. But if you don't understand it, you're not going to understand what you, the health of your business or you're not going to understand the value of your business. And you may also not understand some things that are hiding and really need to pass through your PML. So just real quick, a balance sheet is what you own, what you owe, and what's left over. It's that, it's that simple. And it is a snapshot that is a point in time report. So we generally look at balance sheets at the end of the month, the end of a quarter, or the end of the year. A balance sheet doesn't make a whole lot of sense on Tuesday afternoon, the 13th in the middle of a month, because the things that belong on the balance sheet haven't gone through a month end close process. So those aren't necessarily, we try to look at things on closed periods. So basically assets are what you own. These are some examples of what you may own. We didn't hear too much about any product companies in here, so we may not have any inventory. We might have assets, could be as simple as a computer. Cash is what it is, and AR is if you, if you bill people and they haven't paid you, those are your accounts receivable. Those are your assets. Your liabilities, accounts payable, credit cards, you may have sales tax payable, and you may have other kinds of debt, such as bank loans. It's just a real simple balance sheet. Accounts payable would be things like the light bill or um, your rent or a lease payment on a copier and things like that could be in there. And most of us, a lot of businesses have credit cards. Depending upon the nature of your business, you might have sales tax. Equity is what's left over. Essentially, it's made up of the equity of the business, distributions, retained earnings, other kind of accounting kind of words, I know, um, and year to date net income. So, there's the formula of what this looks like. Is what the, that's a, a, a visual of what I said a minute ago. It is assets are equal to your liabilities plus your equity. Okay. So if we look at um, just real quickly, we divide both assets and liabilities into classes. Current assets are things that are either cash or near cash. They're cash or they're going to turn to cash quickly cash, accounts receivable, and inventory. Long-term assets are things like fixed assets, land, building, leasehold improvements. And then there's other assets, and those things might be goodwill because we bought a company. They might be a rent deposit. Those things are not impacting day-to-day -day business. Uh, and we also always put related party debt or related party transactions as in other assets. So those are classifications. Same thing on liabilities, things that have to be paid quickly, whereas current assets are things that turn to cash quickly. These are things that need to be paid quickly, generally within a month, trade payables, credit card balances, payroll and, and tax liability. Longer term assets would be bank loans and equipment loans. And then other liabilities would be the other side of related party transactions where we might owe a related party or investor or a partner. A liability. So there's a lot of numbers up here, but the main one that I want you to know is why we call it a balance sheet is because it balances. There's $215,000 in assets, there's $215,000 in uh, liabilities plus equity. In this particular case, is this got a little light on it? It does. Um, so in this particular case, their liabilities are $112,000. So the, the difference between the 215 and the 112 is the equity, essentially the equity in this company or what it could be worth in as one method of how to value a company. There are many, but essentially the equity would be 103,000 in this example. Questions on that? 
again, it's at a point in time. It does not measure movement over time. So we're gonna, the reason that's important is the next one that we're gonna see, the PL does measure activity over a period of time. A, a balance sheet is a snapshot at a point in time. So we're gonna move on to the income statement. This is where we talk about how much you sell, your income or your revenue, what it might cost you to sell that. In a lot of businesses, we call that cost of goods sold. We might call it cost of services sold. And then is your operating expense. And we're gonna talk about that a little bit later because it's something that we like to focus on with um, our clients and small businesses. They need to understand what it costs them to open the doors and turn on the lights every single month. You, that is your fixed operating expense. You've got to cover that every month. You're not covering your fixed operating expenses, then you're not gonna make any profit. So, we, the, the, and then the challenge becomes making sure you know what that is. So we're gonna talk about what's left over, which is profit. And again, as we've already said, this is, me is measured over a period of time. So if we use the same kind of format as we did a minute ago to visualize what's on an income statement, it's the revenue from your sales of your goods and your services. You have cost of product sold. You, have, you might have wages to build or provide those. If you own a bookkeeping company, you have bookkeepers, wages associated with producing your service. You might have uh, attorneys that work for you. You might have staff people that uh, work for you. That's your cost of goods, wages, or your cost of sales, wages. And then if you, had, if you were to have a product, if you were producing a widget, then the cost of the, the raw material to create the widget is a material cost. Then this is the one I talked about a minute ago in operating expenses, sales and marketing, your administrative wages and benefits, uh, your rent, your office equipment, your internet expenses, travel and meals and entertainment. Those are your operating expenses. So then what's left? Because there's your formula for this one. Income minus COGS minus expenses is equal to what's left. That's how you get your net profit. So one of the things a lot of small business, we, the key in financials is understanding all pieces of this because if you get focused on nothing but this and saying, well, I know I make $10 on every <laughs> widget that I sell, well, that's great. How many widgets do you have to sell to cover this? Or if you get too focused on knowing that your overhead is X per month, but you don't know how, instead of making $10 on every widget, you're only making a dollar every widget, then you got to sell a whole lot more widgets to cover this. We're going to talk a little bit about that in a minute. Questions on this? I'm going really fast. That's okay. Time for questions. Okay. So this is a income, a, a profit and loss statement. We're going to look a little bit at it. This is a period in time. Remember, the way this one is set up, this is for a month of March. And here's the income number that we talked about as being revenue. These are the COGS that we talked about, the cost of goods to sell something. In this particular case, this company is producing a product. So they have the cost of the product, they have the materials, and then they have the wages. So they're, what we call gross profit is $48,000, and we calculate a percentage of that. That means that their gross profit, they sold $200,000, but to produce the 200, it costs them about 52. So before we ever get to the overhead, they've only got $48,000 left. In this case, their month of uh, operating overhead was 38, almost $39,000. This is um, net ordinary income. So miscellaneous stuff, they make $9,300 for the month or this percentage. Fair? Yes, sir. Can you for this group, differentiate why you have wages in there twice. You have them in this mm -hmm. cost of goods sold wages, and then you have wages and benefits. Good. Thank you, Paco. I planted that question well. Uh, <laughs> so the reason that we do that is these wages are directly associated with producing whatever we're selling. So in, in, in the widget example, 
These are widget makers wages. So that is why that is a cost of good wage. Um, some businesses might not have a cost of goods wage, but in this case, they're building something. So we have wages associated with that. Now the people that run the office and the owner and the administrative and the accounting and the salespeople wages would sit down here under our operating expenses. Does that make sense? Answer that, Paco? You got it, thank you. I have okay. a question though. Okay. So what if you provide a service and not a good, and you have a contractor that is, you're paying to do a uh, service? It, 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 becomes a, it becomes a preference on how you want to see reporting, and then it becomes become being consistent with it. So I, I will use my own little business for that. Um, I, we have contractors that work for us that produce services. And when they are doing work for a client, that gets booked up here. If they're doing work on something in our business or administratively related, it gets booked down here. But the biggest thing about that is, don't get too hung up on that, especially if you're in a service business. The biggest thing about that is pick a way to do it and stick with it. Because what we're about to show you is comparability from period to period. And you want to, for it to be comparable, you want to be booking it the same way over time. So that's the biggest, the best answer to that is pick a way to do it and just understand that that's how you're doing. And in this case, what we've added now is a year to date number. So now we know that our widget company for the first three months of the year has done $590,000 in revenue and their gross margin is a little bit better year to date than it was in March. And their, net, their operating income is this and their net is a little better year to date by percentage than it was um, just in the month of March. So in this example, you're seeing a period of a single month and you're seeing a column that is a year to date of the three months so far this year. Again, over a point of time. So the reason that this is highlighted is back to what I said a while ago. You got to know what your monthly operating expenses are. Without understanding that, you don't know what, you, what you've got to cover before you can put a penny in your pocket from a profit sample. So we're going to talk a little bit about how to read financial statements, because this is where a business owner gets power from financial statements. So I'll, I'll tell you a quick story. I went, I was calling on a client who's still a client. I've had him for almost, for um, probably nine years now. And I met the owner of the business and I was asking him what he was doing with financial reporting. And he had a CPA that was producing a monthly compiled financial statement, nice cardboard cover, little hole in the middle with the name showing through, a little spiral thing and all that stuff. And I said, well, um, and, it, and it just had one column of stuff on it last month, one column. And I asked him, I said, what do you do with that? And he picked it up off of the desk and he dropped it in the trash can because that's what a single month view of a business does for you. It does nothing for you. So to empower entrepreneurs, we like to show them things over time and put information in their hands that they can make a decision to help run their business better. Not just say, I hit a P&L button out of QuickBooks and spit out a report. So we're going to talk about it. Looking at things side by side, we're going to talk about using percentages, which you already saw me use some of those. We're going to look at prior year and year to date. We already talked about operating expenses, profit margins, and a few other things too. So here's our same company again, and this is the balance sheet. Whoops. The reason that this, and we'll go over this real quickly, but here's there's a couple of things you can see on this. Um, your value of equipment doesn't change, right? Equipment stays static. It's not like that's going to change. There's a bunch of numbers up here. I know, Amanda, it's giving you a headache. Um, <laughs> but here's things that do change. For instance, your accounts payable was high, went down, went back up again. Your credit card balance changes. Your bank loans should be going down monthly, which they are. So that's some of the value in looking at periods side by side. 
But the real power of this comes in more. Um, and here's some, here's another example of uh, here's those things actually that I just talked about. Um, but I want to move on to where we start looking at the P and L. So if you remember, we looked a while ago at our widget company, and the, we had these two columns a while ago, right? So these two columns are good. This is the one that, like my first one of my early clients, throws away because it's just a single static picture of one month. If you add a year to date number on it, you get a lot more information. But what if we did this? What if we looked at, now we're looking at March a year ago compared to March last year, and we're looking at a three month trend so far this year. So now we can begin to see where things have changed over time in our business. And then we can add percentages and see if anything looks out of whack from the standpoint of this, these numbers are a percentage of the, this top number. It's the 100%. So what we're saying here is that uh, total COGS is 72% of that, which is why we have 28 left over for a gross profit. So then we start looking at things like a very interesting thing between the month of February and the month of March. You did about the same amount of revenue in both months. One month you did 205, one month you did 200. Cost of goods was 143 in February, but it was 152 in March. So look at the difference that it made in your percentages. More importantly, look at the difference that it made in your gross profit. So it, here, let's just say for a second, down here it's costing us 38 grand a month to run this company. But let's say that it costs 50 grand to run this company. Well, we're not going to cover it in March because we're already at at 48. But in February, the month before, we did because we were at 62. So the real question is, what happened up here? And why did these numbers go up? Primarily wages went up from 28 to 32 during that period. Now, here's another interesting thing about this example. A year ago, we made the same gross profit. But we only sold one hundred and fifty-three thousand dollars. We had a much better gross profit margin. So understanding your margins, you know, we got a lot of small business people get real hung up up here. How much revenue am I doing? What what is what's my top line? How much am I selling? Or we get hung up down here. What's left over? What's my net profit? One of the biggest things you can impact sometimes, especially if you have cost of goods associated with not many of us in this room do, but um, look at the difference in being able to put the same amount of gross profit because these numbers, our cost to produce the widgets were so much lower. So then that takes the pressure off the sales organization. If you're not having to sell 200 to make 48, you're selling 153 to make the same 48 grand because you've got a 31% margin. Here's another terminology that I use sometimes with side-by-side -side analysis. It's called hills and holes. But so this is a, a little thing that you start looking at what your what it costs you to do sales, marketing, and advertising on a monthly basis. Well, it runs 12 to 1500 dollars except for in January this year. Now that may be perfectly fine, and you may know exactly what that what that is, but the, 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 the discipline that comes out of the exercise of sitting down and looking at it is where the value is. If that's a one-time expense because you paid an annual membership or a fee for an advertising agency or something like that, that's fine. But if that's some expense you're unfamiliar with, you don't know why it jumped up that month, then you wouldn't have known that if you looked at January by itself and then March by itself. That's why we look at it side by side. Here's another one down here. Under other income, usually other incomes miscellaneous in this particular company and in most, some little bitty numbers, piddly stuff, maybe you know, doesn't belong somewhere else, $5, $25, $50, $10,000. What was $10,000 worth of other income in February? It could be as simple as it, your bookkeeper made a mistake. Right, Melanie? <laughs> uh, so, but, but, it, but and it, it could also be a legitimate, it could be a, a, a fee from a referral fee or something. It could be something that is truly, 
you don't, if this is, if this is from something that is not recurring in your business, not a main part of your business, you don't want it up there because it distorts this number. So it may really belong there. You just need to make sure you know what it is. Okay. I'm gonna... So we already talked about profit margins. Here's the exact same thing that I showed you a minute ago. These are the same numbers. I've just got them in a small, a larger print and smaller versions. It's the same thing I'm going to show you uh, a minute ago of what happens. For... Is this better? I should have gone with this slide immediately. Make more money, make more net income too, because it still costs you thirty-five thousand dollars to run the company. Costs you a little bit more this month, but not that much more. This is that line that we want to see steady. If we're running a business, we want to know what it costs us. For this particular company, it's cost between 35 and 40 grand to run the company in the four different months that we're looking at. So what does that mean? You got to have 35 to 40 grand in gross profit before you put a penny of pocket in your pocket. Okay. Just real quick. Sometimes if you just put start putting stuff in QuickBooks on your own, First off, it defaults to, to alphabetical listing. And then we might have silly things in here that really don't need to be like something that says copy of paper or Home Depot. Uh, we like to look at things more on a categorical basis and we like to group them so that they make a little bit more sense. So when you look at organizing a chart of accounts, this is called a chart of accounts. We like to put them in things that make sense, like anything that's related to sales, marketing, and advertising would go under a parent account of that. Payroll and benefits goes under <coughs> a parent account, things that are associated with that. Um, the um, office expenses, we have a parent account with copier and telephone under it. That's just a quick little thing of a way to make your financial uh, statements easier to read. Why does not profit equal cash? It, it may be. There is a difference, and I'm not going to go into much about this. There's a difference between a cash basis and an accrual basis. But most accounting systems are on an accrual basis. And there is a big difference. As you know, if you have payables or you have receivables, then you're impacting cash. So if you sold $10,000 worth of widgets, and you build $10,000 worth of widgets, but you only got paid for $5,000 worth of widgets, then you have $5,000 in receivables. So that cash isn't there yet. That's a simple example of what can impact why cash doesn't equal profit. The opposite side is true on payables. You have to pay for the goods to make the widgets. Well, if you push your payables way out there, well, then maybe you do have, a, you, you do have cash because you haven't paid You've sold the widget already, but you hadn't paid for the goods that required to make the widget. That's why the balance sheet's important. If your account's payable is constantly going up, you're pushing payables out, you can see that on the account on the balance sheet. Otherwise, you get happy that cash is growing and you're all happy with cash, but you don't realize what your credit card balance or your AP balance is. So those are some of the simple differences. Why do we care about, well, I just gave you one reason to care about the balance sheet. But the other thing is that um, the, the balance sheet is the strength and the value of your company. Um, and if you're growing a company uh, for a legacy, um, for to sell it, to bring in partners, to bring in investors, then you want to know what your balance sheet looks like. Movement on the balance sheet can be a problem or it can be a good thing. It's also where stuff could be sitting like receivables, inventory, and tables that you need to make sure um, you understand whether it's been updated or not. Um, and because it can hide revenue and expenses. And like I just said a minute ago, if, you're, if your accounts payable is, um, is constantly going up and you had not paid anybody, you're hiding expenses from your P&L because you're pushing them to the balance sheet. I was a banker. <laughs> Right, Paco? Oh, Paco's, Paco's gone. Um, trust me, he would say yes. The answer is your banker cares. So we've talked about these things so far, and I've kind of rushed through it, but we'll have time for questions. I got a couple other quick things. 
Uh, we talk about why financial statements are important. We don't want to keep our head in the sand. Um, we talked about a basic understanding of financial statements, a balance sheet and a PL. Uh, we talked about how to review those, looking for trends, using percentages, doing side by sides. Uh, we talked about the organization of a chart of accounts, talked a little bit about profit and cash, and then why should I care about the balance sheet? I'm going to do two more things real quick. One of them is my favorite model. It's really a model of a little bit of where our business can impact businesses. But if you're a business, and this is the green line is what I'm calling desired revenue. Vertical would be dollars, horizontal would be time. Over time, that's the revenue line you want. If you really, if you want to grow your business, we all want, you know, we want, we want a reasonable uphill climb in uh, revenue, right? So in order to get there, I've created these blue bars, which I call a good infrastructure. If you're going to expect to, to get there, you've got to invest in your company in the way of infrastructure. These are opportunities for infrastructure investments. And when I say infrastructure, don't get me wrong, I don't mean a warehouse or a big fancy building. It could mean hiring another person. It could mean adding another location. It could mean adding a line of business. It could mean using a outsourced CFO. It could mean, you, you know, it could uh, acknowledge that you need an HR staff person. It could mean a better accounting or software system or a better sales software system. So those are the kinds of things that you need to invest in in order to prop up or continue that kind of growth. I've seen companies that are hard-headed about uh, being unwilling to do those kinds of things. And what happens to them? They're happy with their infrastructure because they're not spending any money, but this is their purple line of revenue. It may go up for a while. They may be able to say, we can keep doing it. I don't need that kind of help. I can do it myself. And that might be okay for a while, but at some point your revenue is not gonna continue to grow if you're not investing in your company. My advice to you is make solid accounting practices and financial reporting a priority. It doesn't mean you have to make it your job, which is the second point. It should be important to you to understand that doesn't mean it has to be your job. Depending upon your role in a company, the highest and best use of your time may be producing work, providing services, selling your company. Amanda understands that. Um, because she does understand uh, accounting, but she doesn't wanna mess with it. And she knows it's not the highest and best use of her time. So understand enough about your financials to be able to ask the right kind of questions. That's the real key out of this, especially if you've got somebody else doing it for you, which is great. What did we just talk about? We talked about investing in the infrastructure for your business, and we don't want to be the guy with their head in the sand that we saw earlier. So my challenge to you today, before we start today, we got plenty of time for questions, um, is go take away from this and figure out one thing that you're going to do different in 2022 about the finance and accounting side of your business. And whatever that is, make one change that will positively impact your business from an accounting standpoint. Is it better reporting? Is it getting outside help? Is it cleaning up your chart of accounts? Is it simply learning more about your own financial situation? That's, and that's great if it is. That's a perfect starting point. So that would be my suggestion for you today. And I didn't need to do that. Questions? Amanda. I'm intrigued about this infrastructure stuff. Once I have looked at my numbers, how do I determine where I should make that investment? <laughs> 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 yeah. Yeah. I would, I would, your numbers aren't going to tell you where to, I don't think, in a way they might, 
your numbers are going to tell you if you can invest in it and, and the best way to. But the, the infrastructure is going to be something that you probably feel and know about your own business. I need more help. I need to, um, I'm too concentrated in one line of business. So I need to figure out a way to get into another line of business. I need the best to get into a, another line of business. I've got, um, I'm spending too much time on HR issues. I need to bring in an HR person. So these are things that you're more likely, this is my opinion, and I'm a numbers person, but I think that the kinds of decisions about bringing in infrastructure are going to be things that you know in your gut about your business. And then the way to figure out is use your numbers to figure out how to implement. It's like you're trying to figure out how do I get rid of this bottleneck? Yeah. And that's, that's right. It could be a, what is what is a bottleneck or a, or a roadblock in your business, and is is there an infrastructure to get me over over that? And and it could be it could be software, it could be automation, it could be outsourcing, it could be more hands on deck. Yeah. Other questions. Remember? When looking at the numbers, uh, specifically the expenses. What are some triggers or like uh, rules of thumb where you say there's a problem here? Like this number is more in our industry. I've, I've been told it's like if your overhead is a multiplier, it's like 2.8 or 2.3, probably good. But if you're over that, you're probably too heavy on your uh, overhead costs. Is there a, is there rules of thumb? That there are, but they're very industry specific. Okay. So. Um, it's, it's hard to rattle off anything that applies across the board. Some businesses require more. Uh, there, there are some that you measure constantly. You might measure wages to revenue. You might, uh, another common one is advertising and marketing expense as a percent of revenue. But that target is real different from different kinds of businesses because high traffic consumer businesses spend more money on advertising and marketing than referral based businesses or professional services sometimes. So it depends on the nature of your business, but advertising as a percent, um, your total overhead as a percent, your gross margin as a percent, those are all things. And there are, and we actually have access to a, a national database where we can get some benchmarking data. There's benchmarking data out there. You would want to make sure that you're using stuff that's right for your industry. <laughs> there was enough, somebody. Hi, Megan. Hi. So um, I am a control freak. Most business owners are, and that second bullet scares me. How do I know that I should? How do I know? How do I know that I can trust the person who I would be giving this job to? Our very, our very. I told you trust. Awesome. But I mean, that's the, the trust thing is a real fear, especially when it comes to money. And I've seen a lot of people get taken advantage of. So. What do we look for? Okay, so that that is a that's a huge thing because um, at, because Megan doesn't need to be doing her own bookkeeping, and so she's got to find somebody that she can trust and begin to do that. And you know, yes, referrals and what other business community people tell you about people is a great place to start. Uh, but the real place to start, I think, is to ease into it. And make sure that you stay in touch with whoever's doing it for you. So you ask for certain kind of reporting. You ask for, um, you know, you want to understand bank wrecks, or you still want, you know, the other way to step into it easily is you still keep control of certain things. By the way, with technology these days, there are all kinds of great things that banks can help you set up. Uh, they can set up what's called positive pay. They can give your bookkeeper very limited access where your bookkeeper can um, reconcile your bank account and update your QuickBooks, but they can't touch anything else. I mean, you can control things within banks, um, online access that gives uh, people the amount of access they need to do a bookkeeping job for you, but they can't lose money. And there's all kinds of automation tools from that standpoint of how you set up access. You know, I, I would interview people too. I mean, you know, you sit down and you, you Megan, are good at your gut is good with people. Sit down and talk to three different bookkeepers and decide which one you think you trust. I mean, um, 
you, you, that, that's a good question. And I think everybody answers it probably a little bit differently. Steve? I'll throw this out here. I mean, I use a separate bookkeeper and then very confirmed. So I maintain check and balance. It's a very confirmative report. And then I have a CPA that does it also. So some checks and balances there. And by the way, we do that for a lot of, um, a lot of clients. We perform a role where we're either overlooking their internal bookkeeper or we're overlooking their outsourced bookkeeper. So, but it does give the business owner a, a, a second set of eyes over their account. What else? So, I do a lot of like analytics for our business, and I think the hardest part is scrubbing the data that goes in our analytics. So, what kind of advice do you have for maintaining data integrity? It's very difficult with small businesses. <laughs> so, you come from a corporate accounting background. It's it, that's a world where people understand the importance of that. And, and here, here's why I'm hesitating to answer that question. <laughs> One of the people that worked for me the other day and, and said to me, why are all of our clients books such a mess? <laughs> Well, if it wasn't a mess, it wouldn't be us <laughs> one thing. But, 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 that is, but, but that is exactly actually what we strive to do is to try to get them to where their books are clean and their data is clean and it's being posted consistently. Because, um, and this isn't exactly to your, to your, to your point, but um, if you're not posting expenses consistently the same way all the time, then that example that I showed you of side-by-side -side, um, analysis is worthless because if you're posting the way you pay your independent contractor one way one month and one way the next and your meals are hitting one account one month and one account the next, there's no consistency. So you have, so you have inconsistent data and then it's hard to look at. I want to add on to what Barry's saying as the banker in the room, exactly what he's saying when it's inconsistent data. If you're going to call a bank to go get a loan and you have inconsistent data like this, it makes it almost impossible to give you a loan because we don't know what's going on. You don't know how many times we've looked at people's books and been like, you need to call Barry. Um, <laughs> you need this fixed before we can figure out what's going on because I can't even tell if you're actually making money or not. So just know that if you ever think you're going to need a loan from a bank, make sure you get somebody qualified to do your books. Um, it'll make your life and the paper's life a lot easier. You missed it, Paco. I queued you up while ago. Sorry, when I was out. <laughs> I had a I had a, a bullet point that said your bank cares about your numbers. Well, there you go. And he didn't even tell me that. I just <laughs> <laughs> what else? I think we're supposed to let y'all start moving around. Any other questions? There's three people from my firm in here. You can ask them questions if you want. You can ask me questions. Later on, we'll all be here most of the day. Yeah. Thank you for Thank your you time. Mary.